Myanmar Nangan Minglaba. I would like to say how happy I am to receive President Obama in my country and in my house. The friendship between our two countries is of long standing. The United States has been staunch in its support of the democracy movement in Burma. And we are confident His parliamentary speaker, Thura Yu Shui Man, Myanmar watchers believe he is now a leader in waiting. Prime Asia's very own Glenda Chong caught up with Shui Man recently to try and find out more about him. When asked, he didn't express any if this is your first time listening to our podcast, welcome. Our programming brings a diversity of voices connected to Myanmar to share their perspectives, thoughts, and reflections about what has been happening there since the military coup in 2021. All of our guests share one thing in common, a deep personal stake in the ongoing crisis. And it is an honor for us to be able to bring their voices into your earbuds. But however difficult it may be to hear some of their stories, we hope that you will come away with a deeper and more nuanced understanding of what is happening here. Today we have the honor of being joined by Scott Martial, a distinguished diplomat whose career spans several decades. Scott Martial's diplomatic journey commenced in 1985 as a, as a vice counsel at the U.S. Embassy in the Philippines and went on to touch upon many other countries in the Southeast Asian region following this. For the purposes of this discussion, we're primarily going to focus on his time as U.S. ambassador to Myanmar, a position that he held from 2016 to 2020. So, Scott, thanks so much for taking the time to join us to talk about this very important time that you were in Myanmar with us today. This covers uh, very significant years in Myanmar's recent history. Well, thank you. It's uh, really a pleasure to be on with you. So we're also talking about this recent book that you published, Imperfect Partners, which I definitely encourage listeners to check out. It's, it's really a, a wonderful read. And in this book, you provide insights into policy issues over your decades in Southeast Asia, uh, but you also reveal your own thoughts and feelings, impressions on the job, making yourself a relatable figure to the readers. So what motivated you to want to include this personal perspective, and what impact do you hope it'll have on readers' understanding of diplomacy and partnerships? Well, it's a, it's a really good question, and uh, it's one of those things that as I was working on the book, and writing the book, it, it sort of evolved and how I thought about it. And I wanted to write something because, frankly, there's been relatively little written on, uh, in the United States at least, on Southeast Asia as a whole, certainly on U.S. relations with Southeast Asia. Um, so I wanted to make it a, a book that I thought would be useful for people who maybe were beginning to or early in their careers working in Southeast Asia, and also uh, offer some, some thoughts on, on U.S. policy and the thinking that went behind it, but also the, the realities on the ground, particularly when we're serving in embassies. And uh, I, you know, writing just about pure policy can be very dry. Uh, and so I wanted to, if you will, humanize it or, or, or make it seem a little bit more real by including anecdotes that uh, just like, just like reading a, a good book, uh, that tell a little bit more of the story that you can't get out of the sort of dry policy stuff. 
And it really did that. And I, I also appreciated how by being vulnerable and open that way, not only are you exposing yourself as a real person apart from the policy, but you're also describing a dynamic where rather than a book where it says, well, this is what we did and this is why it was the right move and this is what people aren't understanding. It's not just this pure defense of different decisions, but it's taking the reader into a very complex situation where there sometimes aren't really good options and exposing what you have to work with. And then certainly if any country is a testimony of that, it's Myanmar where sometimes there aren't great, certainly aren't perfect options, but just exposing the context of how you deal with a very difficult situation and maybe you don't make the best choice, but this is the context that you're understanding as you're having to make those decisions. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That was, uh, you know, as you said, it was really highlighted, particularly in the Myanmar chapter. Mm, right. So you encompass your experiences and insights gained during your diplomatic career in countries spanning Southeast Asia, Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, Cambodia, Thailand, Myanmar, of course, also having chapters on ASEAN and China. Uh, but to begin the book, you quote Patrick Wynn, the author of Hello, Shadowlands, who I should mention is a guest next week with us. And he opened his own book by saying a statement, which you open your own book by quoting him, that Southeast Asia is, quote, a heaven for the compulsively curious, end quote. That's just a great phrase. Can you unpack what that means for you personally? Well, for me, I, I, I joined the Foreign Service uh, back in, in 1985 without really much of a background in, in Asia or certainly in Southeast Asia. And uh, I had the opportunity to, to serve uh, first in the Philippines and then, as you said, in a number of other places. And I just find the region endlessly fascinating, uh, whether it's from a, a cultural point of view or history or the politics or the economics and, uh, and just visually, because, you know, part of what we get to do as diplomats is travel around these countries and just experience them uh, and you know, sometimes the best parts uh, are getting away from the capital cities and just dealing with government and and being out in in uh, more rural areas, more remote areas sometimes, and just actually seeing how people live. Uh, so it's it, it's Southeast Asia because it's so diverse. Um, you know, people tend to lump you know Southeast Asia together, and and uh, and I do it too sometimes, but. You know, the Philippines, Myanmar, Indonesia, Cambodia, I mean, they, they have some things in common, but they're remarkably different in, in many respects. Yeah, yeah, definitely, certainly. And then even when you get into individual countries, especially, again, going back to the case of Myanmar, you find even greater diversity within that. And, and speaking about Myanmar, getting more into that, reflecting on your journey, I'm curious to know when Myanmar itself first came on your radar, personally speaking, maybe even before your diplomatic career. What was it that initially attracted you to Myanmar, put it on your radar, sparked your interest in history, culture, religion, political landscape? Well, I think the, the first time I remember paying a lot of attention to it was uh, actually after I had started my diplomatic career, I think in the late late 80s uh, I was working back in in Washington on the what we then called the old Indochina desk uh, when uh, just after the 1988 uprising and just then I began to read and learn about the country and, and particularly about 1988 and the uprising and, and, and this harsh suppression of it and so I began to follow it uh, to some extent after that. And then, but I didn't visit until I think 2005 uh, mm -hmm. when I went out, when I was the, the head of what we call the mainland Southeast Asia office at the State Department. And uh, that was my first visit. And after that, I spent much of my time, even before I was assigned to Myanmar, uh, working on the country. Mm -hmm. Comparing Myanmar to some of the other Southeast Asian countries uh, that, that you experienced and that are in the region, you begin the chapter by drawing this comparison between Indonesia and Myanmar. There's similarities you note, like the presence of a strong religion, a history of dictatorship, powerful military, and then attempts at some kind of transition. But you highlighted that a key difference between the countries, you referenced Thamia U's perspective, that Myanmar lacked a sense of nationhood, 
he called it, uh, quote, an unfinished, uh, unfinished nation. Could you elaborate on this notion of what the different what differentiates Myanmar in terms of its national identity, as well as the challenges this poses in the context of political transition and stability compared to those other countries in Southeast Asia you spent time at as a diplomat? Right. Well, you know, certainly as I mentioned, as you mentioned, Indonesia has there's some similarities. You have to be careful not to take the comparison too far. But in the sense of both Indonesia and Myanmar being pretty large countries, uh, ethnically uh, quite diverse, uh, with a history of uh, dictatorship or a a powerful military, and and even uh, in Indonesia, like in Myanmar, some separatist movements. But in, in general terms, Indonesia from early on had had an effort led by Sukarno, really the founder of Indonesia and the first president, to try to create a sense of a whole nation, uh, mm-hmm. both politically and in a broader community as well. And in Myanmar, you just really haven't had that. Uh, you, you know, going back, obviously, even before independence, uh, the pre-colonial period, during the colonial period, but even after independence, it seems to me that one of the missing things has been this, uh, even an effort to create a sense of we're all part of one nation, uh, even if we uh, um, are, are have different backgrounds, ethnicities, religions, etc. And uh, to me, that has been the fundamental problem. I mean, people mm-hmm. would rightly say, well, the military, to me, they're inseparable because the military has exacerbated uh, this problem, certainly done nothing uh, to address it. It's really hard to have a nation when different component parts of it don't feel like they're part of that nation. Uh, and that's pretty fundamental and I think uh, is reflected in, in the history of conflict and disappointment that we see in Myanmar. Yeah, certainly. I think that continues to be some of the issue going forward today of the uh, – it's, it's been the eternal struggle really since independence – um, going back to your own personal experiences with Myanmar, you referenced how 2005 was your first visit. You described that also in the book. You you described the experience as being reminiscent of a, a Graham Greene novel. Uh, can you elaborate on what aspects of the country or the situation evoked that particular particular imagery for you during that visit? Yeah, I remember very well just driving in from the airport. I think that visit, I was only in Yangon. I, it was a short visit of maybe a couple of days. Or, you know, keep in mind at that point, we had really minimal relations with uh, uh, the government, the military government at the time. So we didn't do a lot of engagement with it. But just driving in from the airport in Yangon and seeing that it, it looked like it could have been out of the 1950s. There had mm-hmm. seemingly been almost no building. There was very little old cars on the street. Mm-hmm. Uh, just the, the complete lack of development, it seemed, yeah. uh, was stunning. And, you know, I'd lived in places like uh, Hanoi in the early 90s that was still relatively poor and just the reforms were just beginning. Mm-hmm. But even then, Hanoi had a different energy to it. And Yangon at the time seemed, I hate to use the term sleepy, but it just seemed like it hadn't moved for a long time. Mm, that's interesting. I, I first arrived in 2003 was my first visit. And so I'm trying to put myself back in my initial impressions and, and experiences. And then as it changed so dramatically over time. And when I think of the word sleepy, I, I that that rings a bell for me uh, in terms of what I experienced. I, I would maybe amend that in my own visit and feel like it was it was lightly sleeping and wanted to wake up. Um, and just the energy I felt was in the conversations I had at the time felt like it was there was there was a desire to want to awake and to explore more, but that it was caught in that state. Uh, and I, I'm thinking specifically of uh, during my first visit, I met a couple monks. Um, at a pagoda and spent a, a day just walking around with them. And this was before the internet. Well, the internet was in the world, but the internet hadn't come to Myanmar yet. And there wasn't a lot of access to like encyclopedias or television or something. And I just remember their curiosity was so beautiful to me in, in that visit. I, I still remember vividly as we're about to cross the street and the monk 
grabs my forearm and, and looks me earnestly in the eye and says, brother, brother, tell me, what are the streets like in your country? What do the streets look like in America? And, and I was just, it was like a television show. You know, he was looking at me like I was this access to information that couldn't come from anywhere else. Uh, and I felt that energy as I was talking to him. So I really tried to, you know, genuinely in as much imagery as I can in simple language, tell him what the streets look like in America. Cause I, he was so curious about this and had no other means of finding this out. And this was, this was just one anecdote, but it kind of seems to other memories I have from that time kind of fit into this, the same kind of vibe of, of just this immense curiosity, insatiable uh, desire to want to know more about the world and such limited ways to do that. And, and those interactions, I, I recognize myself as something of a vehicle or medium for being able to teach them something or tell them something that they wouldn't have access to otherwise. Yeah, you're right. I remember, I don't think it was my first visit, but in subsequent visits, you know, 2006, 7, 8, 9, uh, I would often go to the American Center, which at the time was one of the few places that people could go uh, mm. to to uh, get information, uh, books and, and what have you, take English language classes, but also interact with each other in a pretty safe environment. And I remember, I don't remember the year, maybe in 2007 or 2008, uh, at one time going to the American Center and the embassy had organized a discussion with uh, a number of former political prisoners. And maybe a dozen people came in and I was standing greeting them all as they came in and each one introduced uh, himself or herself with their name and then how long they had been imprisoned. And they all looked pretty young, but many mm -hmm. of them had been in prison 10 or 12 years. Mm -hmm. And I just remember being overwhelmed with mm -hmm. this, the tragedy of, of what had happened to, to them and so many others, but also at the, the courage and resilience of people who had paid dearly for, for things that shouldn't have been crimes and yet were still coming to the American Center because they wanted to organize and find ways to A, learn, but B, uh, contribute to the country. Yeah, and I was an American Center teacher, and in my educational career, I've I've never had students with that kind of burning desire for for wisdom and for knowledge as I had there. That were just it, the the teachers all worked overtime because the 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 sense of desire on the part of the students was so great. It just pushed you to want to do more and to give more. And I, I think also it's it's really powerful talking about this panel of political prisoners that are describing their time incarcerated, because this this is not something that an average visitor gets uh, for the, those people listening who have been tourists to the country or come on meditation retreats. You, you're left with a rather simplistic, superficial view of just a, a, a somewhat happy people that are you know, that are kind and generous and it's terrible what's happening now, but you, you don't get this um, for, for many reasons, cultural and, and fears of oppression and such, you, you, you don't get this public sharing in quite the same way. And that's, uh, I think that's changing with this current, with, uh, jumping ahead to the, the coup and the resistance movement. I think there, there has been step forwards to talk about taboo subjects and to, um, to share in ways that, that one might be hesitant or modest or fearful of before. But I think, it's very valuable when you get a chance on a panel like that, having a private conversation or on podcast conversations like these, where you do have that greater access or insight into the real lived reality that that you don't get if you're just a uh, a foreign visitor looking at things on the surface level. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right, and it, it's great for people to visit. Maybe not right now. But yeah. uh, in, in general, it's great for people to visit and learn and, and get a sense of appreciation of all the wonderful things in, in, in Myanmar. I mean, just the, the cultural richness and diversity is just unbelievable, for example. Yeah. But as you know, but um, so I, I don't want to discourage people from that at all. But it is, as you said, hard to get in behind that into the experience that so many people have had.
Yeah, right. So going, trading back over some of Myanmar's recent history that you were involved in, uh, during the Saffron Revolution in 2007, you weren't there physically. Um, perhaps you might have visited on some occasions, but I don't think you were working out of there. But you you mentioned that your office that you were in at the time was dedicating approximately 70% of its time to the country during that period, which isn't surprising given how big that event was. Uh, as far as you can remember, what exactly were you engaged with during that time of the Saffron Revolution? Right. I was, uh, I think at the time of the Saffron Revolution, I had uh, maybe just become uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the East Asia Bureau. And, and basically what that means is I was kind of the, the, the point person at the State Department for Southeast Asia as a whole. And uh, this was, uh, Saffron Revolution took place at the end of the last year of the, or the second to last year of the Bush George W. Bush administration and President Bush and particularly his wife, Laura Bush, had a had a quite strong interest in in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And so that plus the the horror of what happened in the Saffron Revolution, uh, some of which we could we witnessed on on video, um, led to tremendous effort by on the part of the administration and Congress to find ways to try to pressure the military into change. So there were regular meetings at the White House, interagency meetings. We call them deputies meetings because it's chaired by the deputy national security advisor uh, to talk about what we call Burma. We still called it Burma. Mm -hmm. uh, Burma strategy. What else can we do? How about sanctioning this? How about that? Can we get our allies to do this or that? Uh, so as, as I said, I spent a huge amount of my time uh, doing that and and also traveling around the region, trying to drum up support for more pressure um, on the generals. Yeah, boy, that seems like it's been the story of the last many decades. Is what <laughs> yeah, terrible thing have they? Yeah, what terrible thing have they done, and what can we possibly do to respond to this? And that's what most of your book is about. Um, but then, so then, a little bit after Saffron Revolution, the cycle of Nargis. I, I was there at the time as well. I was fully caught up in that. My my place I was living in was destroyed almost with me in it. Um, oh, but wow. there was in, uh, with Cyclone Nargis, there was this notable growth in civil society that was going on. Again, for me being on the ground at that time, it was incredibly exciting to see. Well, exciting is, is probably the wrong word. Looking back at it now, it was, it was exciting at the time. It was kind of an all hands on deck approach to, to what needed to be done living through that terrible travesty, but looking extending the outlook from that period several years down the line, it really was a critical moment for the growth of civil society. And you talk about that in your book. You describe how uh, Nargis and the the impact of it looking you know, you know, months and years down the line that it prompted U.S. policy to reassess the support and funding because at that time, so much of the, the, the from my, I don't, I don't know if you actually say this in the book, from my memory of being there at the time, um, there was a feeling that I was hearing of U.S. policy that it was uncertain what it could be doing on the ground in Myanmar in, in terms of funding. So a lot of the funding that was taking place was um, were, were uh, the diaspora community, ex uh, exiles, a lot of stuff uh, across the border. Um, and this, uh, what Nargis did with opening up civil society caused a, a shift and a reflection in terms of how it might now be possible to expand and support the growth of civil society within Myanmar. Yeah, right. You're, you make a, a lot of good points there. Up until Nargis, we were providing aid, humanitarian aid, health, educational aid, almost all cross-border uh, from Thailand, uh, which was you know of value, but but obviously limited in in. Uh, geographic scope and, and reach with and, and at, by the time of Nargis I personally had begun to question our approach uh, just because I just didn't see the sanctions being sufficient uh, to to cause any cracks and so trying to think of other ways that we might encourage uh, the beginnings of change in in the country. When Nargis happened, you know, we went in and offered aid, etc. But as you said, civil, we saw civil society springing up and we were able to start providing some funding for that civil society. 
And I remember very vividly a uh, discussion. I can't remember how long after Nargis, but some months after Nargis were some people were saying, okay, uh, the, the relief efforts basically that we've done what we can on that. So let's, let's cut off the assistance. And I and some others argued strongly that, no, we got to keep it going because we see this nascent civil society and we found some channels through which we can provide funding to them. And it doesn't matter whether they're overtly political or not, just, but, but helping to uh, support and this nascent civil society was probably one of the best things we could do. So without too much debate, we were able to continue funding of that, uh, of civil society. Uh, it's, you know, you can debate how much that led to what happened later, but I, I certainly I, I believe that it, it contributed to some extent. Uh, at least once there was opening, you had some, some organizations that were already in place and experienced that could, could build on it. So I think that was very important. Yeah, I think it was too. From being on the ground at the time, more so than than um, uh, removed in terms of policy, as you describe, uh, seeing this uh, out, this uh, the, these groups informally start to form and networks start to connect on what they can do to support relief in the, in, the, <clears throat> in the Delta quickly led to like, hey, we're, we're already here. We're talking to each other. We have networks. Like, what else can we do? What can we do next? And it was amazing right. to see this kind of agency taking place that, you know, wasn't really politically driven. I mean, I don't know really how you define that in a in a concise way, like what is political and not, because the way it was taking shape on the ground was just what else can we do? And there was a sense of agency and a belief that that they they could do better for their community. And as one Burmese friend explained to me very tragically, but I think very aptly as well, we don't really look for a government that's actually going to help us and provide for us. We look for a government that's not going to harm us. We look for a government right. that's, that's going to just have their hands off and let us take care of ourselves without you know, really making our lives terrible. You're basically outlining a contrast between a more like formal and traditional and rigid way of looking at what's happening in a country and out and going outside of that to be more flexible in the approach, out of the box, to look at informal ways of expression and, and what the context is actually telling you. And I think this is an important thing to highlight because I think this is what's often missed in understanding Myanmar and developing policy towards Myanmar, even and especially today after the coup, is that um, there, there are ways of looking at it where you're trying to fit the understanding into you know, formal international uh, ways of of development or or actors or or whatnot, and that's missing the shape of how things are taking in their own way, in their own form, on the ground. And it sounds like that was a bit of the dynamic and the argument that you were facing at that moment after Nargis. Right, and and some of it's just related to the way Washington works. Uh, which is, and, and you know, if you have a regime that's deeply problematic, as as the Tan Shui regime was, the tendency in, in Washington, and and you know, I don't want to separate myself. I was part of that machine, so uh, I, you know, um, involved in that, it, is to pressure, squeeze, sanction, and it, it you know, fine. And morally, it's it's satisfying, but it always isn't always effective. And by that time, we could see that sanctions alone weren't going to be effective. And so you have to try to find other ways. We didn't want to start you know, openly engaging with the generals. They hadn't shown any signs of, of change yet that would have warranted that. But uh, the other point is this uh, sometimes excessive optimism in Washington that, that the U.S. can sort of make things happen in other countries and often mm -hmm. we're accused of making things happen that we had nothing to do with mm -hmm. but whether it was indonesia to go back to the indonesia example and and its democratic transition or what happened in Myanmar, it has to start at you know in the country in the in the um in this case Myanmar, and organically in civil society the development of civil society mm -hmm. is one of the best ways i think to encourage uh, change and to yeah. uh, cause change to happen, or at least to be prepared if there's an opening for change. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's pushing us up on the timeline to 
when you really became involved in Myanmar in a major way. So let's go there now. That was 2016. And you assumed the role of ambassador to Myanmar. This was a critical juncture in the country's history. Uh, just what we're talking about, civil society is starting to be able to uh, to open. Uh, and It's coinciding with some political reforms also taking place at the time. Could you provide us with an overview of what the landscape of the country looked like during that time? What country were you walking into when you assumed that post? Well, we were... I was walking into a country that was in the middle of what seemed to be, what was, not seemed to be, what, what was significant change. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's lots of debate about how real was the, the change under the Tain Sein government. I continue to believe to this day that the change was very significant, very real um, in, in terms of the amount of openness in terms of people's ability to get access to information, to travel, to to uh, to interact with each other, to form political parties or media or civil society, uh, significant economic reforms. Um, so, you know, that was all we thought quite positive. And then I arrived in Myanmar a week before the inauguration of the NLD government in, in March, uh, end of March, early April of 2016. And that may have been the high point in torn, terms of uh, euphoria expectations. And, and this is where it, it, it gets intellectually really interesting because mm -hmm. you have a country that for so long was – just in bad shape in almost every respect because of, of, of the military rule. Mm -hmm. And then you've, by 2016, you've had, let's say four or five years of change. And so, but it's a very incomplete picture, right? Because you could, as I told people, you can look at it and say, this is a country that spent 50 years digging itself. I mean, really the military digging the country into a very deep hole for 50 years, it's begun to climb out of that hole. And mm -hmm. you can look down and say, wow, look how far we've climbed. Or you can look up and say, oh my God, look how much more we have to do. Right. And that's exactly where Myanmar was. So there had mm -hmm. been these positive changes and reforms and opening, et cetera. On the other hand, you still had the 2008 constitution. You still had yeah. this very powerful military. You still had open conflict uh, with lots of human rights violations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you didn't have any institutions. You hadn't had the development of any kind of real rule of law or independent court system, et cetera. So it was all, you know, it, it was a place where you felt like it was moving in the right direction, but with a long way to go. And, um, but overall, my sense from talking to people in Myanmar when I arrived and, and my own sense was, People were hopeful. Uh, that looked like things could get better and likely would get better. Yeah, absolutely. And you also talk about going into that role as ambassador, mentioning that you initially perceive the issue of Myanmar and the simplistic dichotomy between democracy and dictatorship. This is a common reductionist view that we often see framed in international media. And you note how after you had been there some time, you discovered the situation was far more nuanced and multifaceted than the simple reduction. Uh, can you shed a light on what you learned and what aspects emerged as crucial beyond this initial binary understanding? And how did this expanded understanding start to shape your approach to the challenges and opportunities that you encountered during your time in Myanmar? Right. Well, by the time I got to Myanmar, I had spent some time working on it. And obviously, from the Washington perspective, and for a lot of people in the international community, it was kind of, you know, Aung San Suu Kyi and the pro-democracy movement against the generals. Of course, we were very aware mm -hmm. of the uh, ethnic minority communities, uh, the um, ethnic armed organizations and their struggle for uh, to have their grievances addressed. It's not that we were unaware of that. Mm -hmm. I think... What I learned by being there was um, a how how some mindsets 
had had been, you know, it, it wasn't as simple as there's the military mindset versus the pro-democracy mindset. It was much more complicated than that. It was, you know, how people looked at what governance should look like, how centralized it should be. What does democracy really mean in terms of freedoms and, and opportunities? Um, but also really critically, the whole issue of identity, ethnic and religious identity being mm-hmm. so complex mm-hmm. uh, that that I didn't fully, it took me a while, for example, to understand why people and so many people in Myanmar reacted so viscerally to the mention of the word Rohingya, mm-hmm. right? Um, and and understanding that the that in a lot of people's mind is deeply embedded is this fear of their ethnic community being wiped out, whether by migrants or or other ethnic groups or or what have you, and this this sort of pervasive fear, maybe not in the front of people's minds, but in the back of, of their minds, and and how much people really identified with their ethnicity and their religion and how it had been used, unfortunately, to divide the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and also just the fact that there was so much work to do to the lack of trust, uh, certainly among ethnicities, but, but much deeper than that toward the military. Um, I, I don't know that I fully appreciated just how much the military mindset was not open to different views. Mm-hmm. Um, so just over time, and that's true. Anytime you live in another country for the first time, mm-hmm. you astound with yourself. If you're paying any attention at all mm-hmm. with how much you learn and how much you say, Oh my God, this layer after layer that you have to unpack. And, and even after living there for four years, you've only, you've only gone part way through the journey of understanding it. Yeah, yeah, that's really something to think about, especially as your people like you in the capacity of uh, being in a diplomatic role, you're you're not there just to learn something for your own amusement, but you're having to go through this fast-paced, rapid learning process as you're also meeting important people and having to make policy decisions at the same time. So that's quite a handful. Yeah, it, it is, and it, it is what we do. It, it, it highlights how important it is to be out, uh, not only talking to government counterparts, et cetera, but out in society, talking to people uh, mm-hmm. throughout the whole country. Mm-hmm. And so uh, any any conscientious good diplomat will spend all, it will be, uh, my rule was always, I mean, you, you can't avoid making some decisions in your first six months, but to try to, oh. you know, spend the first six months just, going around and, and learning as much as, as you can and just talking to people. I mean, perhaps some people have the mindset that you know, a diplomat shows up with a certain body of knowledge and it stays static. Uh, uh-huh. that, that is far from the case um, uh-huh. that you, but you, but it does mean making sure that you're getting out and talking to a wide range of people, including people who you might strongly disagree with. Yeah. Um, but, but just to get the perspectives and understand why, why are you approaching it this way? Some things that don't make sense to you as a foreigner, like, well, okay, how, why, where does this come from? Help me understand mm. it. Uh, because again, we're, we're guests in the country. It's not our country. And so uh, it's up to us to, to understand why, not only what's happening, but why. Certainly. Yeah. And as you're meeting and talking to all these people inside the country, there's also these important influences outside the country. You reference in your book how after the 1988 democracy movement, Burma became an issue that many people picked up in the West, many people cared about, especially through the figure of Aung San Suu Kyi, which we'll talk about later. But you reference how this grew into becoming a real cause, a cause with strong emotion behind it and led to the development of uh, of the Burma lobby. And this is not one group. This is a collective name, capitalized, I think you have it in the book, that right. refers to the influence wielded by, uh, by, by those outside of Myanmar, particularly in America, that are um, – that – that have strong feelings and and a growing influence uh, in terms of policy and what should be done and a lot of emotion behind it, justifiably, given the real violations that have gone on. Well, as you said, it's a, it's a, a group of disparate 
I shouldn't even call it a group, but it's a it's a, a, a lot of different people with different backgrounds and different kinds of jobs, ranging from Mitch McConnell, you know, who was the Senate Majority Leader at the time and had a had a great interest in uh, in Myanmar, to a lot of people working uh, for nonprofits or media who, for one reason or the other, had taken a personal interest in in Myanmar, particularly after 1988. And I, th- you know, almost uniformly were you know, wanted U.S. policy to be on the side of of the democracy movement, but also uh, the rights of ethnic minority uh, communities. And um, many of these people are very, very well informed. So I, I don't want to sort of suggest that these are people who were interested but didn't know anything about the country. There may be a few people like that, but. Most of the ones I engage with, and I engage with them a lot, had traveled to the countries a lot, spent a lot of time, knew a lot, had pretty extensive connections, and constantly were talking to people. So they had a pretty good sense of what was happening, and in many cases, much more knowledge than uh, many of us in government. So they were really valuable um, uh, as, as sources of information and perspective and also history, um, so that we wouldn't stumble into, you know, make mistakes just by through ignorance. And, uh, t- you know, they, from various pressure points, would, would push hard for the administration to take a tough line toward the generals to do everything possible to support reform efforts. Uh, so they, they were quite influential uh, in policy through the 90s, 2000s, and, and to, through the 2010s. And... Um, I'm still in touch with a number of them and uh, have learned a lot from them. Mm, right. Yeah. I, th- I think when it comes to U.S. policy in Burma, one thing I've constantly heard in talking to people that were involved in shaping it is this role that emotion is playing, emotion and sanctions and, and relations and different policy aspects. Uh, is this something you find kind of is a is some, makes Burma something of an outlier in in terms of um, how strong a role emotion can can play in uh, how one feels about the policy that's taking shape or the outside influences, or is this a pretty common incur- occurrence in uh, in other countries where these uh, where policy matters are being taken into shape? Um, I think it's it's common to have it to some extent. I think uh, Myanmar may be an outlier in in how much of a factor it was and mm-hmm. it has been. And I think I, I write in the book right. in the late 2000s, um, our policy was really driven by anger um, and, and anger that I shared that that the military was just hurting people and killing yeah. people and, and driving the continually driving the down and you it's frustrating and. You know, maybe it's an American thing or maybe it's a universal thing. You just feel like this is so wrong. Um, and so you, you want so much for things to get better, um, which is, you know, which is not a bad feeling to have. Um, the, the trouble is sometimes it gets in the way of thinking about analytically about what actually might be helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, so when the fr- anger and frustration just says, no, let's just keep punishing with sanctions, for example, um, after a while, when you realize that that's not really working, it becomes harder to offer a different approach or to convince other people to take a different approach. Mm, sure. Sure. And I want to get more into that sanctions discussion in a moment, but first just going back into the history of transition and, and opening and recent events in Myanmar. Uh, we have President Obama who visited in 2012. This was quite a significant milestone in the relationship between the U.S. and Myanmar. Um, could you discuss the impact that his visit, his visit had on the country's development and how, uh, how it shaped diplomatic relations, public perception, the overall trajectory of the political and economic reforms that would go on to take shape? Right. I think what you saw with the beginnings of opening and, and reform under Tain saying that the U.S. initially was skeptical, like yeah. a lot of people, is this, is, you know, is this going to be really lead somewhere? And over time, I think we saw enough specific change and reform and, and opening, you know, release of political prisoners and, and what have you, that it began to look like an opportunity for real progress for the country. And that led to 
uh, to a number of things, starting, of course, with uh, President sending Secretary of State Clinton uh, mm-hmm. uh, for her visit, first visit, and then later for, for the president to go. I was, I was actually ambassador to Indonesia at the time, uh, and, and I, when President Obama was there in Bali uh, when President Obama announced that he was sending Secretary Clinton uh, to, to uh, Myanmar. And I, I think the idea was to show that we see the change we want to respond to it and encourage more change. And I think his visit was was similar, that it was, you know, for the president to go, is, hey, we recognize that something's happening here. And you, you go to recognize that and show appreciation for it, but also to encourage more uh, and to send signals that, you know, we, we started an in-country aid program, we appointed an ambassador all those things. So the president's trip, I I think, has to be looked at in in conjunction with everything else. It was part of this fairly significant shift in approach that, in my view, mirrored the significant shifts that were happening at the time. And I think Mm. got the U.S. to, uh, you know, fully committed to try to see what we could do to support this effort. Uh, And, um, you know, people now with the 2020 hindsight are happy to go back and and complain about it. Even at the time, some people thought that the U.S. was moving too fast. Uh-huh. Um, but but I think, as I wrote in the book, you know, when a country hasn't moved in a positive way for so long, yeah. and then you see real, tangible, significant, positive change on a variety of fronts. Mm-hmm. In my view, and some disagree with this, in my view, you can't wait until it's Norway or Switzerland to yeah. act. You, mm-hmm. You've got to, you know, come in I, and, and try to do what you can to support and encourage more change. And uh, so I, I think it was the right move. And um, because, again, if, if, if you want to have influence at all, you've got to be there. Uh, I think it was after Obama's visit when you were realizing that those in American government that were um, were shaping policy on on Burma and, and involved in the country that there really wasn't much information or understanding of the different military leaders at the time in the country their their personalities their characters their aspirations uh, and so they're just became a simple desire to want to get to know the individuals and who they were because it was more of just this monolithic evil empire that wasn't being dealt with after their uh, many years of, of oppression. So how did this knowledge gap uh, up to this time before uh, official, officials got to meet different leaders on a personal level, um, how did this not this knowledge gap impact the United States' approach to engaging with Myanmar at this point in time going forward? Yeah, well, I would I would go back to 2007 to 2010 period when, uh-huh. uh, as you said, <laughs> we were spending so much time on the country, and yeah. you know we knew Tan Shui and and uh, um, Mon A, uh, his deputy, and we uh-huh. knew the name uh, Shui Man and Payne Sane and and others, but to us they were just names. We uh-huh. we we had never met any of them. Maybe our charge de fer and. and and Yangon might have briefly met one or two of them at events, but uh, fundamentally we didn't know them. And part of the impetus when the Obama administration came in and Secretary Clinton came in, we sent up a, 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 a paper, trans, what we call transition paper, on Myanmar where we suggested trying to begin some modest engagement, if, if nothing else, just to find out a little bit who these people were and so that if there were an opening, we would be better placed to uh, to take advantage of it. And so I think over the once you saw the Tain Sain era uh, change as an openness and reforms begin, we gradually got to know some of these people, uh, Tain Sain himself, Shui Man, uh, mm-hmm. certainly, um, and saw that they weren't exactly carbon copies of each other. Um, uh-huh. And and that that's useful because if, if you see everybody is the same, you 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 struggle to really understand what's what's going on in the country. 
So how were they distinctive as you met and others met these distinctive leaders? In what ways did they stand out from each other? Well, I mean, I, I never really engaged with uh, Tain Sane because he he was president before I went out there and then and kind of had, had you know, retired quietly um, by the time I got there. I met him, I think, once or twice. Um, and he was, you know, kind of quiet and, and um, you know, pretty open to discussion, but I didn't have a strong impression. Shui Man, I got to know better. He came to Washington a few times, and then I, I saw him many times when I was ambassador. And he always struck me as somebody who was quite, quite a different type of thinker. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people like him, some people don't, but that's fine. But he, he was, I found him very thoughtful mm-hmm. and one of the few people who, for example, he asked a lot of questions and he was paying mm-hmm. attention to, you know, he remember asking me, so help me understand what's happening in Venezuela right now. Mm-hmm. So there was that curiosity and, 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 and so on. That was quite different. Um, you know, you had someone at a lower level, like uh, 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 Admiral and Minister uh, Sotain, who mm-hmm. um, I first met when we went to Yangon in 2008 after Nargis to offer assistance. He was the one who greeted us and talked with us. But then, um, of course, I met him when I visited uh, when he was working for Tain Sein, and and he was very much... Um, seemed to be one of the people who was who was uh, most open to engaging and, and promoting reforms. Um, and um, so, and I, and I talked to him many times after that when I became ambassador. Um, so you just see that people are different and uh, they're not all, they might come from the same culture and the same institution, uh-huh. but not all identical. Sure. Yeah. And then you have Aung San Suu Kyi, who is, mm-hmm. is really, uh, really broke the mold in terms of the kind of figures there. And before delving into any issue of policy or her administration in general, just staying on this topic of who these people were through personal interactions and, and what you glean from just being in a room with them. Uh, I'm curious if you could share any personal impressions from your interactions with Aung San Suu Kyi. And especially when thinking about so much of diplomacy is based on these personal relations, what did you learn from the time that you spent with her on a personal level? Well, she's, uh, you know, a, a fascinating um, figure and, and you know, obviously very intelligent, very charismatic. Uh, she could be, uh, she had a tendency to be a little bit, um, firm or tough. I mean, one of the first times I met her uh, she, uh, in my official role as ambassador, I had met her a few times uh, before I went out as ambassador when she was in parliament. One of the first calls I made on her as ambassador, she said, okay, she always first, you know, greets me and sit down and says, okay, let's start with the tough stuff first. Mm-hmm. Boom, boom, boom. Um, mm-hmm. So, but in a very, in a direct way, but not in a bad way at all. Yeah. Uh, and then she said, okay, now we got this out of the way. How about this and that? Uh, that's, so, so she could be very direct uh, and she could be, uh, you know, really good sense of humor. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, she could be alternately steely, tough, and, uh, you know, funny, charming. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a, a full personality, um, and, and she, you know, she made it clear early on. I, I found her to be quite open and direct. Uh, she made uh-huh. it clear early on that even if people in the West might consider her a democracy icon, she didn't uh-huh. want to be thought of as an icon. She uh-huh. said, I think, you know, an icon, isn't that something you put up on a wall? Um, and she says, I'm a politician. Um, so um in in those early engagements with her and when she traveled to washington very engaging um later on things you know after the rohingya crisis things became tougher um but that was my my fundamental sense of her Mm, just a small thing you mentioned that she had a sense of humor that's not something i've heard in all the conversations i've had about her that uh her 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 sense of humor coming out so i'm just curious if any examples come to mind of that to try to understand her better and, and her personality uh what ways did her humor manifest or what type of humor was it 
Hmm, I'm trying to remember now. I don't know that I can think of any specific examples. She would just make little comments like, well, you wouldn't want me to do something like that, would you? That, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, right. Not not um, really not really sarcastic humor at all, but just kind of little quips about, um, well, you know, that, that'll just get me in trouble if I do that or something like that. Mm, right, right. And I believe you also had at least one meeting with men online. Is that correct? I had several meetings with men online. Yeah. Mm. I, I don't what remember was, how many. Sure. What, what were your impressions of him? Um, at first, you know, superficially smooth and, and mm -hmm. reasonably polished. Um, but over time, didn't take very long. It, 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 I saw that, A, he, you know, I, I, I couldn't trust what he was saying. Uh, uh, and B, he, you know, he had a pretty strong uh, uh, racist views uh, mm. that, that, you know, most clearly manifested itself vis-a-vis -vis the Rohingya, um, mm. and, um, and, and uncompromising. So again, superficially kind of smooth. And, and I think the first meeting or two were, were pretty decent, but after a while it got, you know, when things got tougher, um, it, it was, uh, we had, you know, we had pretty, as they say in diplomacy, pretty frank conversations. Mm -hmm. Did you have any inclinations as this is someone who could be a future tyrant that tries to bring down the whole democratic experiment of Myanmar? You know, it's hard to say. Uh, I mean, it, it became, you know, our, I think our hope, or I'll just say my hope initially was that Having seen that reform and uh, releasing political prisoners, allowing political competition, all these sorts of things, created some opportunities for the, the what was then what then people called the top madam, um, mm -hmm. to become less of a pariah institution. I, I think there was, you know, at least for me, initially some hope that he would be wise enough to see that. Um, not standing in the way of and allowing further reform, further progress, um, uh, movement toward peace, all these sorts of things would be in the interest of the institution. Um, and over time, it became clear that that wasn't <laughs> how we saw things. And they, they kind of wanted all the benefits without having to, to, to change their behavior. Um, I, I, I don't want to, I won't say that I predicted this coup. Sure. Um, I like, I think a lot of people thought that a coup didn't make sense because the military already had a very favorable political position mm -hmm. and a coup wouldn't really help and would, would, uh, hurt them, which I think is, is the reality that we see now. Yeah. So, um, I, it became clear that he was, you know, he was not going to, uh, support, uh, much in the way of further reform or certainly significant progress toward peace and, and what we were hoping for in terms of a, you know, federal system and, and full democracy. Mm, right. And so now as we're getting deeper into this transition period, we've danced around this issue, but just to, to, uh, to take it on directly, this issue of sanctions, that this is playing, this conversation is playing a very direct role in shaping how the country is going to open up or not and U.S. policy towards it. There were debates and discussions regarding whether to release sanctions all at once or to adapt a gradual approach or a selective approach. Can you provide some insight into the shape that this argument took from different sides and how different stakeholders, both within Myanmar as well as the international community, how they presented their perspectives on the matter, as well as going back also to these, the, the different groups that make up this uh, strong Burma lobby in the U.S. as well. Right. Sure. Uh, I think um, with the beginnings of reform under Tain Sein, you know, you had this heavy sanctions approach uh, before that. And I think the, and I wasn't involved in this part of the policy making because I was in Jakarta, but uh, 2011, 12, 13, uh, you started to see um, some relaxation, some easing of the sanctions in response to uh, progress. And I, I think there was 
general agreement on that, certainly within the administration. Um, I wasn't close enough at the time to know what everyone in the, in the sort of Burma lobby thought. I think there was hesitation to move forward with uh, easing sanctions. Then, um, you know, when I, by the time I got there in 2016, we had eased sanctions but kept a number in place. And what we, what I saw was that the purpose of easing the sanctions is to send a signal that if you keep moving in the right direction, there'll be progress. But what we were seeing on, on the ground was that the sort of salami slice removing sanctions approach wasn't really having much impact in terms of willingness to invest. Uh-huh. Um, certainly by U.S. and I think by a lot of other companies. And and what I was what I heard regularly from the business community was, you know, these sanctions are really complex, and yeah. the penalties if you violate them, even unknowingly, are extremely high. And this market's small, and so our our uh, uh, compliance people are just not going to support anything until it's clear that there's no sanctions problem. Uh-huh. So we saw that the, the that kind of gradual easing of sanctions wasn't resulting in the economic benefit that we had hoped and that in theory you would get by gradually easing sanctions. Um, then some of the some of the economic advisors around Aung San Suu Kyi started coming to us in 2016 and saying, uh, these sanctions are really hurting us. And um, can you can you really look at, at lifting them? And um, at that point, Aung San Suu Kyi was uh, when it would come up with a conversation with her, she would be rather agnostic. Well, that's up to you whether to lift mm-hmm. them or not. Mm-hmm. And you know, there was no way we were going to lift the sanctions um, if Aung San Suu Kyi wasn't on board. Uh, that just wasn't going to happen. Um, so after a while, people in Washington. Uh, began to see that for us to really help the cause of reform, you know, that the NLD government needed to be able to deliver economically. And Mm -hmm. that would be helped. The one area we could affect that would be with, with sanctions relief. So I and a few others began to argue that maybe we should consider lifting sanctions. And that led to discussions with Aung San Suu Kyi where we presented the options to her. And um, she decided that lifting the sanctions made sense. And she didn't do it lightly. Uh, I I don't want to speak for her, but, you know, she, she knew there were, you know, there were pros and cons uh, of doing it. And we all knew that. But in the end, she decided that the, the risks, uh, the, the benefits outweighed the risks. And based on that, um, there was agreement in the White House to lift sanctions. A lot of the business community, of course, supported it, but they didn't drive it. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of people in the Burma lobby um, opposed it. Um, and inside Myanmar, uh, it was, there were mixed views. Some people strongly supported it. Others opposed um, and because they thought it would remove leverage. Uh, but in the end, um, President Obama uh, agreed to lift the sanctions. And, and this is the important point that I think some people are still not getting. Mm-hmm. The, the, lift, the decision to lift the sanctions wasn't, okay, you've done enough, sanctions are gone. Right. It was, what policy decision action can we take that can most support the reform movement, realizing that there's an ongoing struggle. And that was the basis for lifting sanctions, not, okay, everything's done. We all knew there was a lot of work to do um, and, and a lot more that, that had to happen. But the, the argument, and I, I believe it to this day, the argument was that the NLD needs to succeed and part of succeeding, the NLD government, excuse me, needs to succeed. And part of succeeding means, you know, delivering economically. And if we've got sanctions in place that are inhibiting that, then we should lift those sanctions to give them the best chance. Um, and, and that was the basis for the decision. 
Mm, right. Last year, we had Erin Murphy on the podcast about her book, Bur Burmese Haze. She referenced how the thought going on at the time was, okay, this is an imperfect situation, but what is going to have a better chance of success is exactly uh, is is the is um uh, letting the sanctions go and hoping that the force of the free market and civil society and the openness brings it down the line far enough that that natural order of things does more than we could ever hope to do with policy and it starts to take shape on its own and has its own natural momentum? Or do you do you more buy into the argument that that things are so corrupt and so bad and um, and the potential for harm is so great that you need to have very carefully shaped policy that prevent freedoms and access of movement and investment in some way, but that you're you're still keeping a hand on because it's not quite ready to, to remove it from the way that she framed this is just the role that emotions play into the sanctions argument and that sometimes you're doing something more because it feels good and especially in this situation where that you can the US is not, is not a big player in in Myanmar and and has um you know doesn't have a lot of leverage and so when you don't have a lot of leverage you do the things that feel good even if they might not be as effective and so uh, and so in describing this sanctions argument uh, and, and whether or not to release all of them or some of them or none of them, the, this was the different rationale that she explained. Uh, and so with this rationale in mind that the reason for lifting them was that the, the momentum would carry its own force beyond what any policy could do, and that would bring it beyond past the point of no return where um, – where the society would would take its own democratic shape on its own or move in that direction that was the intention of it it was an it's an imperfect context and an imperfect solution but it's in, going along with your your book's name imperfect partners uh, nothing is perfect here but it, that's the intention of why the sanctions are looked at being removed what was the result what did you see in terms of the impact of that decision yeah, I mean, just to, to follow up on what uh, your comments about Aaron, who whose book is great and 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 Aaron's terrific. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, again, there's no guarantees in this stuff. You're all you're weighing things, and and people who argued against lifting the sanctions, as you said, they have a legit, they had a legitimate argument. I disagree with it, but that's that's normal. Um, yeah. And and but I think for me, people tend to greatly exaggerate the influence that the sanctions give you. Mm -hmm. It's not like the fact our our sanctions even before 2010, before we uh, began easing them. It's not like our sanctions were keeping the generals from, you know, carrying out horrific crimes in Shan and Karen and 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 Kachin State or holding 2,000 political prisoners. Mm -hmm. And the notion that if we had just kept the sanctions on, the military would have behaved is just not supported by any evidence. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think people ascribe to sanctions much greater leverage and influence than the than the reality is, um, and I think uh, the lifting of sanctions gave an uh, an immediate boost. It did not produce the flood of U.S. investment that I think some in Myanmar were hoping for, because the investment environment still wasn't that great. Uh, but it did greatly ease uh, financial flows and financial transactions, which had been probably the biggest negative impact that sanctions had on the overall economy. I mean, people could transfer money and 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 sort of carry out normal international business. So I, I think they had a it had a positive impact on the economy, mm -hmm. and it, it it kind of helped sort of people see Myanmar as a, quote, normal country, um, as opposed to still a pariah. Because if you've got sanctions against you, you're still a pariah. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's, it's hard to measure. Um, but just like sanctions aren't a perfect tool, lifting sanctions doesn't solve all your problems either. Mm, and I was talking to Jack Meehan about this just recently on the podcast the, from the U.S. Asian mm -hmm. Business Council and asking his views on it. And he pointed out, like, look, how long were sanctions removed? I mean, the the the, the minute they were taken away, the Rohingya crisis comes up and they're back in place. Not literally the minute, but in terms of as far as investment goes and how right. how much stability you have. It was, I don't know how many months it was, 14 or some year and a half, something like that. Uh, he pointed out that it was kind of an insufficient uh, period of time to judge the experiment because – the Rohingya crisis. And the Rohingya crisis was, I mean, Jack talked about the impact that it had on putting sanctions right back on. In your book, right. you talk about the Rohingya crisis 
the role that played in terms of tarnishing the reputation and kind of derailing all of this messy, complicated uh, stuff moving forward that that the Rohingya just um, just sucked all the oxygen and swallowed everything up and took on a new prism. So, um, so I think it's probably probably appropriate to transition to looking at this Rohingya crisis. And Mm -hmm. this really kicked off right when you arrived. I mean, October 2016, ARSA led this attack on the police posts in Rakhine State, and then there was a disproportionate response by the state. And you describe a a two-day visit. You were shepherded to the affected region. So can you describe your experiences and observations during this visit and how this initial experience coming right at the start of your tenure there, how it started to shape your understanding of what was going on in Myanmar on the way forward? Sure. I mean, you know, we all were acutely aware of the the mistreatment and the institutionalized discrimination against the Rohingya going back a mm. long time. And, and that had not improved. Uh, that was, you know, it, Myanmar had made a lot of progress in a lot of areas, but not uh, in terms of its treatment of the Rohingya. So right. um, it, as you said, in, in early October of 2016, uh, you had that ARSA, initial ARSA raid slash attack uh, and then the military with its you know, wildly disproportionate response. And what was at the time was just this horrific, unimaginable crisis that was later dwarfed, you know, the following year by an even bigger one. Um, uh-huh. And we were, you know, we were clamoring for access because you got all these secondhand reports about what's happening. And, you know, you, you might have an opinion, but you'd like to be able to see yourself. So uh, we were clamoring for access, we, the diplomatic community. So finally, the, the government slash military took us up to Rakhine. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's far from, that's not really an ideal way to see things because you've got the military with you. But we had literally no other way of getting up there. And we were taken to some villages. Uh, first village we went to was completely burned down. Um, second village, uh, or maybe it was the same village. I'm now I'm forgetting. Um, and we were there, and suddenly, out of some a nearby forest area, a, a group of people started walking toward us. Turned out to be the Rohingya community from that village. And one of the guys, you know, he was a village chief or who it was, self-appointed spokesman, began to tell us about what had happened. And I'm, I'm, you know, we're there with the Minister of Border Affairs in uniform and a bunch of soldiers and police uh, with guns, of course. And in the middle of the conversation, they, the police slash soldiers grabbed the guy and I said, what, what's going on? And the minister said, well, we've got to arrest him. He was involved in the attacks. And I, I was just shocked. And I, I said, minister, if you arrest this guy, that's the end of the trip. We're, we're not, I'm not going to continue on with this if you're going to arrest the people who talk to us. Mm-hmm. And he said, but he, he was involved in the attacks. I said, you, if you arrest the people we talk to, then the only you know, the only conclusion we can draw is that you don't want anyone to talk to us. And that's how it's going to look. Yeah. And so they, they let him go. And then later they looked for him. But I think he got away. Um, I have no idea, you know, who this guy was, whether he was involved in the yeah. attacks. But um, the government was quite angry with me, uh, not just the military, but the civilian government was quite angry, basically said I had, you know, later said that, you know, I had, you know, forced them to release a terrorist. And I, I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? I mean, you send, mm. you bring up a bunch of diplomats to assess what's happened. And then the first person they talk to is arrested while you're mm. talking to them. You, you can't, you just can't do that. So it, it kind of highlighted to me the vast chasm in thinking yeah. about these things uh, yeah. between, uh, between us and them. How do you explain that logic on their part? They, I don't know. I mean, yeah. uh, I, but there were, it, there were a number of times where, you know, we'd go up to Rakhine with people from the government and they would show us something and then say, now, see, you see, we were telling the truth. Now, can you go tell the press that we were telling the truth? And it's like, mm-hmm. what, what, what world are you living in? Yeah. I mean, um, now to go back to that first visit, cause it's important. When we went back uh-huh. to Sitway airport, there was a lot of press there. Mm-hmm. And many of them were demanding for us to 
assert that all the allegations against the military were true. And we said, look, we, we, we go up and we visit, we see some burned out villages, and we go to some other villages, some of which are burned out, some of which are not touched. It's, and, and of course, we can't be confident of what anybody's telling us because there's military all around. People are going to be careful. So there's, mm-hmm. we're, you know, we're not some investigative body, but we're just trying mm-hmm. to get a sense mm-hmm. of what happened. And there was mm-hmm. a lot, there were a lot, particularly the Western press, there were some very angry people. So the military was angry with us because we wouldn't just go repeat their argument. Mm-hmm. And some in the press were angry with us because we said, look, we, we can't say this happened. We can say a village was burned down, but, you know, that's about it. Um, so we were, you know, for the first time kind of caught between these, these forces. Yeah, and that's, uh, to me, that's really one of the most vulnerable and uh, um, – and and touching parts of your book, uh, one of the most honest parts, where you you break down and describe on on an emotional and personal level, on behalf of yourself and other embassy workers, how you were feeling being involved in this while also having to do your job. Uh, I wonder if you could read that passage. Right, and and this I'm talking about the period um, in late, let's say late 2017, when you had the the even larger. Um, mm-hmm conflict and violence and mass exodus um, uh, of Rohingya to Bangladesh in, a, in an operation that we initially called um, uh, um, ethnic cleansing and later decided was determined to be genocide. So mm-hmm. by this point, it was pretty clear uh, what had happened. Even if we didn't know every detail, it was pretty clear that the military had carried out this horrific operation against the Rohingya community and mm-hmm. that a lot of people outside of the military in Myanmar either didn't believe it or didn't seem to be troubled by it. Right. So the passage is, uh, um, the subtitle is, How Do You Respond to Horror? By that time, and frankly, even earlier, the magnitude and horror of what had happened was weighing heavily on our minds at the embassy and within the broader diplomatic community. Some of my embassy colleagues were saying aloud that they had not signed up for this. They'd come to Myanmar to try to help a country move forward down the democratic path, not to watch it carry out ethnic cleansing against a vulnerable community. Others asked pointedly, why are we still helping these people? Some were depressed. Few of us slept much as we would lie awake at night wondering what we could or should have done differently. In Washington, our colleagues colleagues on the Burma desk had become virtual pariahs themselves, guilty by association. And I think what really stands out with this passage is you're opening the door on uh, the more formal proceedings and way you have to engage that we all see from the outside, you know, and um, and that... And, and the real personality behind the emotion that you feel, but you can't show because you have a job to do. It's, a, it's what, a four or 500 page book. You talk about 35 years across many countries. There's no two paragraphs that spoke to me in that same way of really bringing out that strong personal emotion of what the job entailed at that time. Yeah, it was, um, it was a, you know, certainly by, uh, by far the most difficult period of my career just emotionally and 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 as you know as head of the embassy trying to uh, deal with the very strong emotions that that people felt now i i want to i hasten to add the 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 discomfort that we were feeling pales in comparison to what the rohingya community was going through at the time so i don't want to suggest at all that i'm i'm comparing the two but yeah i mean when you're on the ground in a place where something horrific is happening. And it's, I think it's even worse than if it's a natural disaster because if this is a man-made thing and when frankly, and this, you know, this won't be very popular in Myanmar right now, but it's the reality of very few people in the society um, shared our views or, um, or, or, you know, um, offered any support for the Rohingya community um, yeah. it's it's very difficult to to fathom and and to deal with yeah 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 I know and for someone speaking for myself someone living in Myanmar during that time uh, 
it, it was just baffling. I, I mean, I had lived in Myanmar 10 years by that point. I had many deep connections and friendships, uh, particularly with Bamar Buddhists, because that was after the American Center. I was very much involved in the monastic culture and meditation side of things and was very inspired by that. And it was also very confusing for me to encounter a number of people that I really inspired and looked up to as far as, as meditative wisdom went that were not exactly on the right side of this. And um, and I, I it's something I still kind of grapple with trying to understand and how, how that could come to pass. And, uh, you know, I think... A large part of it that has come out more lately is this propaganda machine, you know, the yeah. military propaganda exploding on social media. Uh, one, ins- one, one memory comes to mind as we're talking about this that I, I think you might appreciate where I was with um, my neighbor was this beautiful Bamar Buddhist man, just pure heart and selfless and uh, so helpful. I couldn't have survived without him. Uh, so many difficulties that we went through and, in, and, in, in trying to live there are things we didn't understand. And just anytime a meditator or a foreign monk would come visit us, he'd just help out in any way and just be so joyous and how, how he was able to give and, and help people. And at one point he came over to, I was with a, a friend of mine who was a monk from the Netherlands in my house and he came over really excited and said, you know, I just had this really great meditation, several hours. I just had these insights that there's no, the, the, the difference between I and you, it breaks down and, you know, there's, there's me and there's this, um, this animal, and I, I'm Burmese and you're American and man and woman and old and young. These are, these are all just, they all just dissolve. And this sense of the ego, you know, and just describing this Buddhist philosophy, but basically he's very excited because it wasn't a intellectual understanding. It was this profound meditative experience he just had of seeing how the identifications of who people were all broke down and letting go of this ego. And my friend and I kind of look at each other. We're talking to him in Burmese. And so I kind of said, my neighbor didn't speak English. So I talked to my, I kind of whispered to my friend, like, you know, this kind of feels like an opening. I think we can, you know, follow my lead. Let's go in this direction. So I started asking him, you know, oh, so there's no difference in, in, in human or animal or man or woman or Burmese or American, blah, blah, blah. You know, kind of going slowly, hesitantly. And I say, mm-hmm. oh, how about Rohingya? Like, what about Rohingya and Bamar? Like, what do you, you know, is there a difference in that? And immediately he looks at me with this kind of shock because, and I knew I was doing this. I I mean, I love this guy. I'm doing it very carefully, very delicately. I'm a trainer by profession, so I have the skill and, you know, how you navigate these difficult conversations. I'm not trying to set him up. I'm really trying to, like, expose him to two ways of thinking. And you could see that in that moment, he's torn between this profound Buddhist insight that is the ultimate truth of the world that he 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 has faith in as a Buddhist and he's just experienced as a meditator juxtaposed next to the propaganda he's been fed about the dangers the Rohingya pose to a Muslim invasion of Burma. And yeah. he's, he's juxtaposing these two things. And it's kind of like, what do you believe in more? Do you believe more in, in the underlying Buddhist reality of nature and, and of self? Or do you believe more in the danger of the Rohingya? And, and you could just see that, that kind of clock or that, that the inner workings of like, what, you know, how do I navigate this? But he's such a saintly man and so, so honest and, you know, but also affected by this propaganda. So he just delicately starts to kind of pick this apart. And he's like, you know, you're, you're right. Like he kind of says it, you know, hesitating and checking himself, but he's like, you know, you're, you're right. Like, there, it doesn't make any sense to say, to, to have this profound Buddhist realization from my meditation and then to say, but the Rohingya are somehow outside of this, this whole paradigm of, you know, the, 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 the sense of self and identity in the world. And, and yeah, so he acknowledged like, you know, you're, you're right. There, there's also no difference there. And we're also, we're the same beings, we're the same core, the same human nature. And, um, but that memory stands out because it was really, in that whole period, it was the only time I had any success at trying to very carefully engage this conversation because so often the rhetoric coming back was so extreme. And this gets into what you said earlier in the conversation, this idea that when I asked um, how you started to break down Myanmar and understand it beyond the reductionist terms of democracy and dictatorship, your answer was basically ethnic identity and, and the complexity of that. And, um, and so in this moment, you know, this was one moment where I was able to break down ethnic identity through, you know, Buddhist lens of the ultimate reality, yeah. no sense of self. But for the most part, I, I just, I just had to stay quiet and just, I, I mean, not, not out of lack of trying, but once it became clear how severe 
um, this was and, and, and how little, little wiggle room there was for these conversations, it was just very confusing to have such respect and inspiration from certain people that then just had views I couldn't reconcile with. Right, right. I, I agree. I had similar experiences and people who I knew well and were big human rights defenders and, and you know, very smart, uh, well-informed people still had, still believed that the Rohingya were a threat um, to the sort of Buddhist soul of, of Myanmar. And as an outsider, it's baffling, to use your word, but Obviously, a lot of people felt it uh, a fair amount, you know, they're subjected to, you know, years of propaganda. I mean, we've got our own race issues in this country. So, you know, mm-hmm. we, we know how. I mean, I, I found myself thinking, you know, at one point, like, what, what if I were a, you know, Scandinavian diplomat in the Deep South in the 1950s? Uh-huh. And, you know, I've just had this wonderful dinner party with these wonderful people. And then the issue of, you know, blacks or African-Americans comes up and it's completely, and I say, oh my God. Um, And, you know, so you end up having these sort of philosophical debates in your own mind. It's like, is everybody just an awful person or is it the environment they're in? And, you know, I have to believe it's the environment that they're in and, and the information and the propaganda, but it was bad. Yeah, and that's where you um, you have to find some angle. I mean, in that moment, I was, religion is such a powerful angle, and and as that had come up naturally, we already had that connection of Buddhist meditation. It was able to use that angle to um, to navigate that, and yeah. you know, I think your example in the Deep South is that's a great one. And I I, I would in that theoretic ex- example, I would wonder about the Scandinavian diplomat falling back on some form of, of Christianity to, uh, to question and, and to, right. to, to navigate. I mean, one of the, the, the topics I'm always interested in on this platform is when monks or, or Burmese Buddhists come on and asking them in their own words to describe how they see the Buddhist teachings aligning with a democratic and inclusive society. Yeah. And, uh, and, and because this can't be seen as a threat. And and this is something historical in Myanmar. I mean, they, you know, in various times in Myanmar, they've seen, going back to the colonial days, they've seen science or English language or, or different aspects of modernity as a threat to their traditional way of life and their religion. That continues to this day. People like the Bawa Sayada today, who's openly talking about how improvement in society and more opportunities are a threat to Buddhism. But then you have other leading monks like... A contemporary example would be Junpin Sayada, who was a guest on here, or a historic example would be Lady Sayada, the 19th century, that mm. were able to to greet these these different aspects, whether it was you know science or economy or um, English language or other things, and and realize these were not threats. And in this case, you know, the Rohingya people in an inclusive society and democracy, these are not threats to. Um, to your faith and your way of living, there are ways to incorporate these things into these beliefs so that you have a richer life. But, you know, these fears are there. Yeah, for sure. Going back to this, the the role that you found yourself in as a diplomat, you you mentioned in the book there are instances where you had to address the charge that the U.S. was, quote, giving up on Myanmar and claims that there were even some claims that you refute very strongly in the book that the international community actually bore some responsibility for the Rohingya crisis. And, but at the same time, you have to approach, uh, you meaning the embassy and, and leading the embassy, have to approach the situation cautiously because you don't have a complete understanding of the whole picture. You know, I think that that example of coming back from the air or going, going to the airport after the visit in Rakhine illustrates that. And this caution seen as hesitation was viewed really negatively by others that you weren't doing enough and you weren't even saying the right things you had to say. Uh, whereas from your side, you know, you're you're exploding with all these emotions and everyone working in the embassy is at the time. But you also have to be pretty careful with what you say and do based on the information you have. So can you elaborate on this dilemma that you're facing and formulating the right response and navigating these really heightened emotions in a very difficult and complicated situation with very high stakes? Right. Sure. Well, if you go back to the, the the sort of height of the crisis, if you will, starting in August of 2017 and for the next few months, it, it, the immediate thing was to try to get 
accurate information. And then once it became clear that you had this massively disproportionate force being used by the military, driving out uh, hundreds of thousands of Rohingya with a, a, a lot of violence and including sexual violence, uh, well documented, um, then it's, you know, focusing on, I mean, there were plenty of people around the world, including Washington, New York, screaming at Myanmar about it. What we were focused on was what can we do to, to change the situation, to improve the situation. First, convincing them to stop the military operation. And then second, once it had stopped, you still had large numbers of people fleeing because even once the violence on a large scale stopped, still the conditions for the Rohingya were, were, were you know, horrific. And so many, many more people fled uh, to Bangladesh even after that. And so what we focused on was trying to, going back to the Kofi Annan report, which had come out the day of those that big second um, set of ARSA attacks in August 2017, with very practical recommendations on how to address uh, the, the broader Rohingya crisis and the Rakhine crisis. So we were going back to that. We would go whenever we could get access. We'd go to Rakhine, talk to people, talk to Rohingya, kind of get a you know, on the ground view of what was happening and then go to Napita and talk to the ministers and sort of say, here's what we see. Here's what we think might be possible. Have you thought about this? Could you do this? Trying to get them to take even baby steps to improve the conditions and the rights um, of the Rohingya community. And really most of the rest of my time in, in Myanmar was spent on that effort which you know resulted in maybe very limited progress if any but that was the focus what can we pr do in practical terms to make things better um, or at least start down the path of making them better yeah right and that's getting into a lesson in international relations as you mentioned that during this time the country is making progress in certain areas while facing really serious challenges in others. And as the Rohingya crisis explodes, none more than this. And so as a diplomat, the situation is presenting this unique set of complexities. So were there any case studies or policies or previous protocols that were able to guide you in navigating how you handled progress in one area and extreme backslide in another and how to approach the task of prioritizing and addressing these areas of progress while concurrently also facing these challenges in areas that that require improvement yeah it it's <laughs> so i don't know that there were protocols or even case studies that were used so much but we did a lot of a, a lot of sitting down and, and brainstorming and thinking about how should we approach this whole country right now. I'm talking about at the embassy. Mm -hmm. um, and and it was obviously we've got to, priority number one has got to be to keep pushing any way we can for progress vis-a-vis -vis the Rohingya community. But on top of that, there's still a lot of other problems. There's a lot of other vulnerable uh, communities that have suffered as well. Um, you know, ethnic minority communities, but just you know, people who who live desperately poor lives, and you know, there was a kind of a debate about. Well, some people, including particularly in Washington, were like, basically, hey, they're all supporting the move against the genus of the Rohingya, so why why bother? Yeah. But our view was, no, you know, our view was that, um, you, you know, what's happened has uh, is awful, and we're not going to hide from that and we're going to focus our, our top priority is addressing it but there's a lot that still can be done to try to support others who are trying to make the country and their own communities better places and so we would try to to you know continue you know assistance programs and the like that would try to help uh local communities around the country uh, move forward um, economic reforms that would that would create more job opportunities and so on, and I think my our sense was that you know it's going to take time, and it may not succeed, but this is the best um, hope for the country, and 
and best hope for the country, it's probably also the best hope for the Rohingya community over time. Not to give people a pass for what's happened, but to try to help the country move forward in a way that hopefully over time, it can begin to address uh, the Rohingya community. So that was um, the thinking. I remember uh, Tom Mien Oo, I think, wrote at some point uh, that you, you can't fix Rakhine if you don't fix Myanmar. And mm-hmm. I took that to heart. Um, and, and so that's what we tried to do. But it, it was a struggle. It was a lot of anguish and, and um, not everybody agreed. And uh, it was, you know, again, it was, as you said earlier on, there weren't any great options, it, but it was trying to be uh, as much as possible focus on what we could do to make things better. Right. And mentioning the criticism that was received from some of those policies, especially after the coup, I think after the coup took place, a lot of the people that were in the I told you so category saw the coup as a a real justification that these policies were wrong, that the transition was an illusion, that this was all just temporary, and that they accused the the U.S. as being driven by an eagerness to want to open the country up for business. And pointing out a perceived uh, euphoria. That's a, that's a word you use in the book, that there is a criticizing a, a euphoria feeling among U.S. officials, uh, pointing to the exploding crisis in Rakhine State, along with the land grabs that were happening at the time. Uh, you express feelings in the book that you thought these criticisms were unfounded and unfair. Um, can you expand on why you think so? Yeah, I mean, first of all, given what's happened, uh, the Rohingya crisis and the coup. I think all of us who are involved in policy need to be very, very humble and mm. open to criticism. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are things that I and others could have done or should have done differently. But first, um, I, I don't think that the change underway uh, that we saw from 2011-12 on to, until the coup I don't think that was an illusion. I think that was Mm -hmm. real. It didn't go Mm -hmm. far enough, but I mean, you can't tell me you live there. You can't tell me that things didn't change mostly for the better uh, for the vast majority of people in Myanmar. That doesn't mean that obviously not for the Rohingya, not for the Kachin and Mm -hmm. and not for some others, but overall um, things, you know, were, were, were definitely better for a lot of people in the country. Um, euphoria, I think that there was certainly excitement that finally this country, after decades of not moving, seemed to be moving in a positive direction and a lot of hope. But sometimes mm-hmm. it was like that, you know, there was euphoria toward the military. And so I was like, I don't think I ever saw euphoria toward the military. Mm-hmm. There was mm-hmm. certainly some hope that they would see it in their interest not to get in the way of further reform. Uh, and you can criticize that as naive, but uh, I, I, I can promise you I never felt euphoria walking in to talk to the military leadership. Uh-huh. Um, so that was just a little bit misplaced, along with this sort of notion that somehow it was the international community's failure that caused all this to happen. And, and that's just I just think that's nonsense. It's one mm-hmm. thing to say the international community made some mistakes. Fair enough. Again, we should yeah. be open to criticism. But um, it was Myanmar that carried out this horrific operation against the Rohingya um, yeah. and led by the military, uh, of course. And it wasn't, it wasn't the international community. So I think people get a little carried away on that front. And yeah, I feel strongly about that. Mm. So I'd like to close by looking at post-coup Myanmar, but just before we jump there, I just want to go back to something you mentioned in your last answer. You, you, you mentioned how things got better for many people in Myanmar, not the Rohingya, as well as the Kachin. So just want to have a, a, a focus on some of the hardships that was going on with the Kachins at the time and with the ongoing battles of the KIA, the Kachin Independence Army and, and the military sure. and the involvement that uh, the, that, uh, the American mission had at the time. Yeah. And well, as you said, the world's attention and media attention certainly was focused on the Rohingya and, and ours was to a large extent. But mm-hmm. certainly we were continuing to engage with and travel to Kachin and, and other areas on a regular basis. I went to Kachin, I don't know how many times. Um, and uh, because 
you know, they had had a ceasefire with the military for many years that had been broken in, I think, 2011. And mm-hmm. the entire time I was there, there was a uh, heavy conflict between the military and the KIA, KIO, uh, and a lot of Kachin people suffered. Uh, I'm visiting IDP camps and, and Kachin and, you know, people who for years now had been stuck in these IDP camps couldn't move on with their lives. Um, and trying to talk to both KIO, but all, particularly the military, General So Win a number of times, trying to get them to to have a ceasefire and uh, you know getting the frustration that you know it's not a very compromising mentality in the military on much mm-hmm. of anything and certainly not on that so yeah i mean the fact that the rohingya were suffering in a in a very short period of time i mean obviously they'd suffered from discrimination for years but in mm-hmm. terms of the violence uh, an incredible amount of people affected directly by violence in a very short time that, that mm-hmm. in numbers terms dwarfed what happened. But yeah, I mean, the Kachin, the Shan, the Karen, others have all had periods where they've been uh, the victims of, of these sorts of atrocities, maybe not on quite the scale, at least in such mm-hmm. a short period, but equally sure. horrific stuff. And um, so yeah, it's all part of the fundamental, you know, one of the fundamental problems of Myanmar, which is the mindset and and, and behavior of the military. Mm, right. Um, moving now to post-coup Myanmar uh, and looking at the developments in the past couple years, do you feel that your current positions and perspectives uh, about the country and what needs to happen there are a continuation of your pre-coup work or – has the coup prompted you to reevaluate certain aspects? Uh, in other words, have recent events uh, in the past couple of years since the coup caused any shifts in your approach or priorities or the way that you perceive the direction of the country? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think, obviously, there have been significant changes in the country uh, since then. and but But overall, I... I believed when I left that um, the country needed to obviously address the huge problem of the military. Um, second, it needed to address the problem of sort of identity and the grievances of ethnic minority communities in a way that wasn't really addressed even during the NLD government. And third, I thought um, I thought there needed to be generational change. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in, in thinking. Yeah. Um, and, and I think all those views are sort of reinforced by what we've seen with the coup. I mean, obviously, uh, if anyone had any hopes for the military before the coup, they, they hopefully they no longer do. I mean, this, yeah. this is an institution that's just so rotten and so brutal and, and, and has, has enjoyed impunity for so long. I just don't see any way uh, forward for the country as long as it exists in its present form. Um, I think, you know, there have been some hopeful signs in terms of increased awareness on the part of at least some people in the country about that they had been fed a steady diet of propaganda, not yeah, only about the Rohingya, but about other communities. And, and, and it's hard for me to know from afar how, how far that's gone, but it's at least mm-hmm. a start. And you see it reflected even in the in some of the comments and uh, stuff from the NUG and so on. And third, I mean, who knows how this is going to play out? But you are seeing, in many ways, a significant generational change in terms of the in the resistance and who's who's doing what. Um, so um, it it has also reinforced my my. Um, it has also reinforced my belief that there was real change in the country mm-hmm. between 2010 and 2020, because I think one of the reasons the resistance is so strong is so many people had a taste during those 10 years of not only greater liberty and democracy, but also opportunity. Yeah. And they saw, rightly saw the military coup as taking away all of those things. Yeah. And all but ending their hope for a better future. And I, so I, I think that the military wasn't prepared for that, obviously. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's 
horrific to see the coup, the violence afterwards, the suffering, the day-to-day suffering of so many people who either displaced or lost their jobs or victims of violence. Um, and, you know, it, it makes me feel even more strongly, uh, it both admire the courage and resilience of people in Myanmar and just hope and wish that somehow they can find a way to move forward. I, I realized there was a, a question I, I neglected to ask as we were on the Rohingya and moving ahead. I, I just wanted to go back to it now. Uh, we talked about your relations with Aung San Suu Kyi and her, um, what you gleaned of her personally as you were having different conversations and interactions. I, I wanted to ask specifically about when the Rohingya crisis came to the forefront. We we know her public statements and we know the actions that her administration decided on. That's all public record. But as far as your conversations and interactions with her, behind closed doors when this issue came up. I'm not asking to reveal anything that, uh, that that's private and, and, um, and meant to stay that way, but more just the general feeling of, of how these conversations and interactions would, would go when you would broach the Rohingya crisis. Yeah. Well, uh, early on in it, I and a few others were able to talk to her, you know, uh, in a small group setting, uh, a handful of times with one or two of her close advisors and, and have, I think, pretty good conversations. And, um, I, I don't want to pretend to know what was going on inside her head, but, um, it, she certainly didn't say or do anything that, that suggested any hatred or, or condoning of violence toward the Rohingya. Um, but I think she was skeptical of some of the uh, reports and allegations about what was happening over time as the crisis continued as, you know, 2018 into 2019, it became harder to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, She was kind of would, would, would sort of move off the subject pretty quickly. Um, And again, I, I, I'm speculating, but I did speculate in the book about this so I can repeat that. I, I don't know, but I, my sense is that, that she and some of the people, maybe many of the people around her, you know, just had convinced themselves that a lot of these allegations of human rights abuses and violence against the Rohingya were just not true. And yeah. I, I think had sort of bought into some of these conspiracy theories yeah. um, that were just not true. Um, There was a certain amount of cognitive dissonance, I guess I want to say, that Mm -hmm. just didn't want to um, address. Um, So it was it was difficult uh, to to have those conversations with her and and ended up talking a lot more to the ministers who were handling the issue. Um, Yeah. And it's I mean, I I it was. You know, there was all the debate about should she have her Nobel Prize taken away and all that sort mm-hmm. of thing. I, 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 you know, not not that for me to uh, expand on. My personal view was at the time was she earned that Nobel Prize by doing remarkable, courageous things and with mm-hmm. enormous sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't mean that she should be free of criticism. Now, I, I don't. I, again, I, I don't have any reason to believe that she condoned the violence against the, or, or hatred toward the Rohingya, but I, I think I, I wish she would have used her enormous popularity and influence in the country to offer up a, a different vision during the crisis of how, of what kind of country Myanmar wanted to be and how that meant treating everybody with respect and dignity, uh, whether you thought they were, quote, citizens or not. Um, I think that was a huge missed opportunity um, that that um, you know added to the tarnishing of her reputation. Yeah, I, I agree, and I can't help but think back to what you said earlier in the conversation about her pointedly saying to you that she did not want to be a democracy icon. And one way you can take it is, um, well, I don't, I don't want to be a, an icon that people can think of as they want. I want to engage in the hard, messy matters of this country and have to make hard decisions and, and lead in a way that's right, that's, that's apart from this kind of idealized icon. But another way to take it, which is quite disturbing and I hadn't thought about until we were having this conversation, is that I, I guess the first way 
is in looking at democracy icon that she doesn't want to be the icon part. The second way to look at it is she doesn't want to be the democracy part. And I'm not suggesting that's, you know, that's what she's saying, but it, at the at democracy is a big word, but it's, and it's also not, it's a nuanced word. It's not a black or white thing. As we've seen in yeah. our own country, we've had democracy in America for certain people at certain times uh, and not for everyone uh, until different reforms were made. And so as I'm repeating those words in my mind that she did not want to be a democracy icon, she's telling you explicitly, I do not want to be a democracy icon. Uh, part of it is not just that she doesn't want to be an icon. She wants to engage in the messy work of, of leadership. But part of it could also be, I don't know, it makes me question. It makes me wonder. It's, I, I don't know what the answer is, but it makes me wonder what her views on on democracy and, and nuanced understanding of federal democracy would be and that she doesn't want to be pigeonholed in a Western understanding of uh, our, our understanding of free and fair elections and human rights and inclusivity and all these others that, um, that she might have different feelings and conditionings than those people labeling her a democracy icon would like to see. Yeah. And, and, and it's, again, it's, it's, you know, pure speculation um, on, uh, it would be pure speculation on my part. I, I think, I, I, I certainly believe that she believed wholeheartedly in democracy in the sense of free and fair elections, civilian control of the military, those sorts of things, uh -huh. um, based on particularly after the Rohingya crisis hit, where you saw sort of a, a, a lack of effort to move forward on some other, you know, political liberalization fronts. Um, I don't know how much of that was because they were feeling so much under pressure uh, because of the Rohingya crisis, or that was just the way she thought of things. But certainly you didn't see, you saw some backsliding on press freedoms and, and those yes. sorts of things. Yeah. And, um, you know, so uh, again, we'll, we'll never know what would have happened if there hadn't been this Rohingya crisis. Um, but, um, you know, on the other hand, uh, she and the, and her party won an overwhelming landslide victory, um, yeah. in, in the 2020 elections. So the people of Myanmar, uh, still very much viewed her, uh, in, in a positive way. And, you know, they're the ones who get to vote. Yeah. Yeah. And it also, makes me think we don't know what would have happened if she would have stayed in charge. We don't know what would have happened if Aung San had been assassinated. There's a lot of yeah. different theories about what he would have developed. Uh, but speaking about just communication and conversation, interactions, which is the, one of the core duties of a diplomat is, is being able to talk to everyone. Um, I understand that you're now doubtful about uh, what progress engagement with the military in Myanmar can do in terms of leaning to meaningful outcomes, given their track record of <laughs> to be unreliable partners, to say the least, um, is first just asking if this is an accurate understanding of your feelings on the matter. A and if they are, it's really quite devastating for a diplomat to suggest that communication isn't going to be very effective taking place, considering that, again, at its core, diplomacy involves fostering dialogues and engagement with anyone as the top priorities. And so what implications would this have in the way forward in Myanmar and how to, how to even think right now about pursuing any kind of positive change or progress in the absence of any kind of effective engagement or dialogue with the military? Yeah, no, you've, you've, um, you've expressed my views um, on mm -hmm. this. I mean, generally, and I say this uh, explicitly in the book, I mean, generally, I, I believe in engagement uh, in, in the vast majority of circumstances, um, in, with a, with a junta right now though, a, lots of people have tried to engage them and what, you know, UN envoys, uh, visitors, uh, visiting, uh, leaders of governments in the neighborhood, Ban Ki-moon, et cetera, with no, uh, results, um, at all to speak of. Second, they're, 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 you know, waging war against their own population in the most brutal way imaginable. Um, and, and so I, I don't see anything in their behavior that leads me to believe that they can be reasoned with. Yeah. And if, you know, um, and, and I don't say that lightly. Yeah. So to me, uh, I mean, look, it's up to the Myanmar people. 
if if people in the resistance and others want to engage them, that's that's it's their country. They do whatever they think. But from an outside perspective, in terms of what the U.S. and others might do, I think having a line or two of communication open mm -hmm. so that there can be um, conversations, if appropriate, is not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be by the U.S. It could be by others. Mm -hmm. um, because you, you want to have a line or two of communication open in case things begin to change mm -hmm. and there's an opportunity. You don't want to miss it. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about, you know, flying in the Napy Dog, going to see men online and in, you know, all that, that sort of thing. I think that I see no value in that at all. To me, the military are the, are, has started this problem with the coup and the violence. They're the aggressors. They're the ones who, ostensibly at least hold the levers of power and they have more firepower than the resistance. So if they want to start, if, if they get to the point that they want to look for a way out of this, and I hope that happens, mm -hmm. then that's the time I think for dialogue, mm -hmm. but they need to be the ones to show that this is what they want. Otherwise it's in my view, a, a waste of time. And all you do by going and seeing them in APTAs legitimize them. Again, I think there are ways, whether it's the UN or neighboring countries or others um, to have lines of communication open to them at various levels. So that if they say, Hey, look, we're, we're looking for a way out, you know, again, you can follow up on that, but otherwise I, I, Sadly, I don't see any any reason to be talking to these people. It should be rather, what can we do mm -hmm. to put more pressure on them? Most of the pressure is coming in from internal forces, but put more pressure on them so that at some point they look for an exit strategy. Um, right. Otherwise, I, I can't imagine, as again, as an outsider, I can't imagine what kind of deal could be struck. Hmm between the military and the resistance. I can't even imagine it. Yeah. Um, and again, if Myanmar people think differently, that it's their country, they can certainly pursue that. Uh, absolutely. But just from my perspective. So the only hope I see is for the military to be sufficiently weakened that key elements of it look for a way out. And then there's an opportunity for engagement and dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a devastating picture. And I, I, I thank you so much for your time and being so generous with this conversation. I have just one more question. It's probably the, the hardest question of these two hours. So I apologize and throwing it at the end. But it's a it's a it's a very important, uh, yet also controversial part of this current conflict that is, uh, I, I think, is not really being properly understood in the debates that I've seen. And, and I hope, at least on this platform, that we're able to have more conversations about this issue directly, because it's, um, it's, uh, it, it takes on just a very um, um, strong feelings on either side. And that's the question of what kind of material support, including lethal support, weaponry, to PDF, NUG, EROs, etc., that uh, the international community and specifically the U.S. might consider. So what, um, what are your thoughts on, on that possibility? Yeah, that's a really tough question that I've wrestled with, and I'm not sure I have 100% certainty in my own mind about what's the right thing to do. Um, I do think that there should be more international assistance um, to the various elements um, that are opposing the military assistance in the form of, uh, you know, financing for, for on the humanitarian side, um, and training and support on local governance in those areas where, and, and public services in those areas where, uh, uh, where ethnic, um, groups or NUG or PDFs are attempting to build local governance. I think there's a lot of opportunity there, maybe on communications. Lethal weapons, I mean, one, you have the very practical, how do you even get them into the country, given sure. that the neighbors are not uh, really one. Two, I mean, it, 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 there is a certain concern, particularly as it seems that some in Beijing are increasingly seeing this as a, you know, the U S versus China, U S support for the resistance. This is against China. There's a risk that if the U S in particular starts sending weapons into the resistance, that this might 
you know, magnify this U.S. China angle that that wouldn't be a good thing, and that could lead China to redouble its support and its arms for the junta. So I think there's a lot of factors. I I, I think the maybe it's this is the more cautious way, but I think there's a lot of room for other support, financial and other. Um, to the various elements of the um, of the of, of the pillars that are working against um, against the military junta, but also um, important discussions uh, that perhaps can be facilitated about what because because you have not only the resistance against the military and the, and the necessary need to push the military out of political power, but also the whole rebuilding of a, a sort of a new Myanmar nation um, at the same time yeah, almost. And, right. and uh, there's a lot of tough questions to be addressed, like if and when the resistance, quote, succeeds in pushing the military out of power, what happens to those civil servants who continued to work? Um how, what, what is your police force? Um, all of these sorts of things. I don't have the answers to those. It's not for a foreigner to say, but there's a lot of work that could be done to sort of encourage and facilitate this, uh, you know, honest discussion about really tough issues, not to mention rebuilding the economy and, and, you know, getting people back in their homes and all those sorts of things. So I think there's a lot of work uh, to be done um, short of the lethal side, um, the lethal side, I, I'm, I'm still grappling with that. Mm-hmm. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that honest answer and for all the time that you took with us today. Uh, before we close, is there anything we haven't talked about or that you wanted to expand on and, and address before we uh, we finish here? Um, I, I don't think so. I think we've we've covered it. I. I, I I think, you know, it's easy as an outsider to say, you know, long-term patience, persistence, but, you know, if you're in the country suffering and victim of violence, that that, yeah. that doesn't really work. But I, I think for the international community, it's really important to stop with the notion that it's just a matter of the right envoy going in and talking sense to the generals and mm-hmm. starting a political dialogue. That's just mm-hmm. just far, that's just divorced from the reality of Myanmar right now. And I, I think people need to understand that the military junta has no ability to govern or to bring stability to the country. And nor is there some easy compromise deal to be struck uh, through, you know, a couple of weeks of negotiation. And that there should be an effort to support all these elements that are trying to build a new Myanmar. And some of that is, you know, building trust among communities and, and overcoming the decades of, of friction and, and distrust. Um, so a, a little bit of more realism on the part of, of some, um, some governments that may have good intentions, but seem to have a kind of, in my view, distorted view of the real situation there. Yeah. And just to follow up with that, if, um, uh, one extreme, I guess the lighter extreme would be sending a magical envoy who has some big breakthrough and the heavier extreme is send lethal assistance, what is in between those, especially in the context of a fractured country that's in in violent conflict up and down right now, lacking stability, uh, lacking clear direction and leadership, um, given the the reality of the conflict taking shape right now and the instability and looking between those two extremes, do you have a sense of what could be done right now by the international community? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I think, 80 to 90 percent of whatever happens is going to be decided within the country by people of Myanmar. And that's uh-huh. just a reality. I'm not sure that the international community has some, some, you know, can offer um, much that will be decisive. Um, but I think a lot more could be done on pushing for hum- uh, humanitarian access channels. Sure. Um, and that's where Thailand could, could really help. Uh, and we'll see what happens with Thai politics and whether that creates an right. opportunity. Um, two is um, more engagement with not only the NUG, but the various elements of uh, that are opposed to the military junta um, mm-hmm. to try to understand their views and as much as possible encourage cooperation. And as I said, overcoming, uh, building, building trust among different communities, um, more more thinking about what can be done, you know, longer term planning about uh, economic rebuilding and so on. 
um, support for, as I said, local governance, um, all of these things, more support for people who are displaced, um, educational opportunities, because you had a poor education system, then you had COVID, and then you have the massive disruption from the coup and aftermath, and more money and creative approaches to help uh, provide education to people in Myanmar or people who had to flee Myanmar. Otherwise, you have a whole a generation that's lost. Hmm, thank you for that. Thank you for all the time you took today. Again, the book that you published on your diplomatic career in Southeast Asia is Imperfect Partners and suggest for any listeners to check that out. It's really a great read and the chapters on Myanmar are especially fascinating. And thank you again for taking the time to be with us and share these thoughts. Thank you. My pleasure. For whatever reason, even as the conflict in Myanmar continues to worsen, it somehow continues to be shut out of the Western media news cycle. And even when the foreign media does report on the conflict, it's often presented as a reductionist, simplistic caricature that inhibits a more thorough understanding of the situation. In contrast, our podcast platform endeavors to portray a much more authentic, detailed, and dynamic reality of the country and its people, one that nurtures deeper understanding and nuanced appreciation. Not only do we ensure that a broad cross-section of ideas and perspectives from Burmese guests regularly appear on our platform, but we also try to bring in foreign experts, scholars, and allies who can share from their experience as well. But we can't continue to produce at this consistency and at the level of quality we aim for without your help. If you would like to join in our mission to support those in Myanmar who are being impacted by the military coup, we welcome your contribution in any form, currency, or transfer method. Your donation will go on to support a wide range of humanitarian and media missions, aiding those local communities who need it most. Donations are directed to such causes as the Civil Disobedience Movement, CDM, Families of Deceased Victims, Internally Displaced Person IDP Camps, Food for Impoverished Communities, Military Defection Campaigns, Undercover Journalists, Refugee Camps, Monasteries and Nunneries, Education Initiatives, the Purchasing of Protective Equipment and Medical Supplies, COVID relief, and more. We also make sure that our donation fund supports a diverse range of religious and ethnic groups across the country. We invite you to visit our website to learn more about past projects as well as upcoming needs. You can give a general donation or earmark your contribution to a specific activity or project you would like to support, perhaps even something you heard about in this very episode. All of this humanitarian work is carried out by our nonprofit mission, Better Burma. Any donation you give on our Insight Myanmar website is directed towards this fund. Alternatively, you can also visit the Better Burma website, betterburma.org, and donate directly there. In either case, your donation goes to the same cause in both websites except credit card. You can also give via PayPal by going to paypal.me slash betterburma. Additionally, we can take donations through Patreon, Venmo, GoFundMe, and Cash App. Simply search Better Burma on each platform and you'll find our account. You can also visit either website for specific links to these respective accounts or email us at info at betterburma.org. That's Better Burma, one word, spelled B-E-T-T-E-R-B-U-R-M-A dot org. If you would like to give it another way, please contact us. We also invite you to check out our range of handicrafts that are sourced from vulnerable artisan communities across Myanmar available at alokacrafts.com. Any purchase will not only support these artisan communities, but also our nonprofit's wider mission. That's Aloka Crafts, spelled A-L-O-K-A-C-R-A-F-T-S, one word, alokacrafts.com. Thank you so much for your kind consideration and support.